you are going to hear a conversation between a student and an academic advisor. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. You Hello there. You must be Jane. Please come in. My name is Mrs. Dunstan. Hello, Mrs. Dunstan. Pleased to meet you. All right. Now let's see. Now you're interested in attending university in Canada, is that right? Yes, and I have a lot of questions to ask you. Okay, but before I begin to answer your questions, I need to ask you a few questions first. Now your major is engineering, mechanical engineering. Right, and where did you graduate? I graduated from the Beijing Institute of Machinery in July 1998. I completed my bachelor's degree. Okay. Now I'm assuming you'll want to continue studying in that field. Am I right? Actually, I'd prefer to do an MBA if possible. But if I have no other choice, then I'll continue in mechanical engineering. Okay. Now, are you familiar with the requirements for an MBA degree? Yes. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. I think I need to do well on the GMAT, and I'll definitely need the TOEFL or IELTS, right? That's right. You'll need at least six hundred on the TOEFL or six point five on IELTS. In addition, you need to have completed a bachelor's degree too. Did you take the GMAT yet? No, but I plan to take it in August. The requirements for a master's degree in engineering are a little different. You'll need to take the GRE and, of course, the TOEFL or IELTS. I see. And when do I start to apply? The best time to start the application process is in November or December of the year prior to your intended year of study. Application forms are usually available in September or October. Which schools in Canada offer the MBA degree? Of the approximately 50 universities in Canada, 20 offer an MBA. Here's a small booklet summarizing Canadian university programs. You'll find all the information on page 22. Great, thanks. And how about tuition and scholarships? Tuition for MBA programs has been steadily increasing. Some universities now charge the full tuition, meaning that there is no government subsidy. Those universities cost about ten thousand dollars per year, and it's a two-year program. Other universities are still government subsidized, so the tuition is only about four thousand five hundred dollars per year. In terms of scholarships, usually the top five students entering the MBA program are given a generous scholarship. All other students have to pay the full fees. International students have to pay the full tuition. That's ten thousand dollars per year. Oh, is it very difficult to get into an MBA program? Yes, in fact, the competition is very strong. MBA graduates have a pretty easy time finding a job, so many students are eager to do the program, thinking it will guarantee them success in their careers. Well, it sure does sound like an excellent way to start a promising future. Um, what is the school year like? Classes begin in September each year and finish before Christmas. They resume after New Year and finish at the end of April. And after April, why? That's your summer holiday. Sounds great. I want to thank you, Mrs. Dustin, for all your help. I really do appreciate it. You're very welcome. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to contact me. You know my number, right? I sure do. Thanks very much. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. Everyone knows that we have achieved a huge amount in terms of space exploration. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Everyone knows that we have achieved a huge amount in terms of space exploration. The space race between ourselves and Russia went on for nearly 20 years, but we were the first to land a man on the moon. At that time, the space race was very close, and the Russians very nearly got to the moon before us. For me, the most exciting invention, and the invention that really showed we were ahead in the space race, was the reusable space shuttle. It was first successful in 1981, and has since been used on many missions. The reusable shuttle can carry astronauts on space missions and can serve as a laboratory in which to conduct experiments. It can be used to transport equipment to space stations or to collect or repair satellites. The shuttle carries between five and seven crew members. When a mission is complete, the shuttle fires thrusters, which propel it back into the Earth's atmosphere. It then glides down to make its landing. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Although the remains of very early ovens have been found in many parts of the world, it was here that they were first used frequently in people's homes. In ancient Greece and in other parts of Europe and Turkey, people used ovens to bake bread. But it seems there was only one large oven that everyone shared. Here the remains of villages from 5,000 years ago show that each mud-brick house was constructed with an oven and that baking bread and perhaps cooking meat was very common. The ovens were made of clay and shaped like a beehive. Inside they had shelves so that a number of loaves could be cooked together and an opening at the bottom from which ash could be removed. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. Maria is a student at university. She has handed the first draft of an essay to her tutor. The tutor has read it, and now they are discussing ways the essay can be improved. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation 
and answer questions 21 to 25. Well, Maria, I have to say I was quite impressed by your essay. <laughs> it's a big improvement on the last one. Really? I'm glad. I put a lot more work into this one. I really spent ages on it. Mm. And it shows. You've addressed most of the problems I pointed out last time. In particular, the style and language are much more appropriate for an academic essay. So that aspect is OK? Absolutely. If you carry on like this, you shouldn't have any significant problems in that department. That's a relief. I've been quite worried about that, although I've been reading a lot of other essays to try to get the right style. Well, I'd say you've been successful. There are just one or two minor things you could look at. Uh, your punctuation's quite basic. It's really just full stops and commas. And parentheses. Brackets? Y yes, brackets if you prefer. In academic writing, these are best used only occasionally, if at all. You use them rather too often. OK, I see. And uh, I'm sorry to mention it, but you're spelling. I know, I know. But I'm working on a foreign computer. The spell checker doesn't work for English. Are you sure? Have you tried changing the setting to English? No, I haven't. Well, I should see if that's possible. I haven't marked you down this time, but, well, some of my colleagues are a bit old-fashioned about spelling. I'd try to get that sorted out if I were you. OK, I understand. I'll try to change the setting. Hmm. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. The only major problem I have with the content of your essay is the introduction. Oh. The introduction should, well, introduce the theme of the essay. Mm. You've put some of the most important points there. <laughs> For example, this bit. Um, yeah, the statistics about the growth of railways in the 1850s. That really should go in the main body of the essay. Yeah. And so should this paragraph about changes in patterns of employment. In general, I'd say your introductory section should be no more than half as long as it is at the moment. Mm, OK. And I should move those points forward? Precisely. And going back to the railways, they're one of the most significant factors for change in this period. Mm. But apart from those statistics in the introduction, you only briefly mention them. Yeah. I'd like to see a lot more on that. And the influence the expansion of the railways had on patterns of social and economic behaviour. You mean how with the railways people could travel to find work and could meet people from other areas? E exactly. Then in the midsection, well, it's not a big thing, but this quotation from the Times. You think it's too long? <sighs> Well, you said it. <laughs> I, I couldn't think of a way to shorten it. Do you think it's really necessary? You mean I could just get rid of it? Yes. You've already made the point and backed it up with other evidence. The quotation's redundant, really. OK. Well, that'll be easy. There were various other minor points, uh, which I've noted in the margins. Mm. You can look at those later. But moving forward to the end here... <sighs> I wasn't quite sure what this meant. The final paragraph? Yes. Are you saying that, on the whole, the changes of the mid-19th century tended to improve the lives of ordinary people or not? It's not very clear. Mm, it's not? No, it isn't. I'd add a few lines clarifying your position. OK. When do you want the final draft? No, oh, uh, the end of term will be fine. Um, but there was just one other thing, the bibliography. Did you really read all these books? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> just the books you actually consulted will be fine. 
You don't need to include everything ever published on the subject. <laughs> right. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Goodbye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear some facts and figures about Australia. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Now, I should tell you that the country of Australia is made up of six states and two territories. These are the Australian Capital Territory, New South Wales, the Northern Territory, Queensland, South Australia, Tasmania, Victoria, and Western Australia. The national capital is Canberra. Right. Let's turn to the Australian economy. Australia has a prosperous Western-style capitalist economy. Australia is a major exporter of agricultural products, minerals, metals, and fossil fuels. Commodity prices have a big impact on the economy. Australia suffered from the low growth and high unemployment typical of the OECD countries in the early 1990s, but the economy has expanded at reasonably steady rates in recent years. In addition to high unemployment, short-term economic problems include how to balance output and inflation and how to stimulate exports. The economy is made up like this. Agriculture, 3.1%. Industry, 27.7%. Services, 69.2%. The labor force has a similar pattern. The total labor force is 8.2 million. 34% work in finance and services. 23% work in public and community services. 20% work in the wholesale and retail trade. 17% work in manufacturing and industry. And 6% work in agriculture. What are the chief industries of Australia? They are mining, industrial, and transport equipment, food processing, chemicals, and steel. What are Australia's main agricultural products? They are wheat, barley, sugarcane, fruit, cattle, sheep, and poultry. And who do we sell our products to? At present, our chief export market is Japan which takes 24% of our exports. After that, South Korea takes 8%, and New Zealand and the U.S. each take 7%. In years to come, however, we expect China to become a significant trade partner. China already supplies 5% of Australia's imports. This is the same amount as New Zealand. Meanwhile, we take one-fifth in fact, 22% of our imports from the U.S., 
seventeen percent from Japan, and six percent from the UK. So, what sort of things does Australia import? Well, we import a lot of machinery and transport equipment, especially computers and office machines, also telecommunications equipment, and in addition, we have to import oil and petroleum products. So let's move to the subject of communications in Australia. We have an estimated 8.7 million telephones and 9.2 million televisions. There are some 134 television broadcast stations and 325 radio stations. The related subject of transport is naturally very important in such a big country as Australia. Let's look at highways first. There are two kinds of highways, paved and unpaved. Paved highways are regular roads with a permanent surface. But actually, we have more unpaved highways, around 60%, than paved, when all the country roads are included. In addition, Australia has a railway network of over 38,000 kilometers. But you'll probably find it hard to believe how many airports we've got 10, 20, 50. No, the total is 443. Of course, this includes many short runways on farms and in the outback. There are only nine airports with runways of more than 3,000 meters. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.